Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I'm a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and this is Pines with Aquinas. Sometimes I record these videos to try to determine what it is that I actually think about something. And recently, I was writing an essay about attachment and detachment, and I was trying to pin down, yeah, what I actually think about the matter, and I found that it was more slippery than I previously thought. So the point of this video is to determine where we ought to be attached and where we ought to be detached and to kind of tease that out throughout the different aspects of our lives. So that way we can be more holy and perfectly given to the Lord and attached or, as it were, free from those things which might otherwise chain us or enslave us. So let's get after it. Okay, my working proposal is that not all attachments are bad because we're not trying to just root out all attachments so that we can be wholly and entirely unattached. The point is to be attached <laughs> to the right things and that we cultivate certain detachments so as to promote other attachments. And I think a good paradigm for this is thinking about the sacrament of confession. When you go to confession, you examine your conscience and you determine which sins you have committed and then you confess the number and kind of those sins. And when you do so, there's a kind of tendency of the heart to think, ah, if I but try harder, I can root these all out. When in fact, our experience isn't quite that so much as it is when we come to discover the Lord and his love for us, right? And when we begin to grow in a life of what? Sacrament, prayer, friendship, study, penance, etc. It's more that those things are crowded out of our hearts than that they are like rooted out of our hearts. So I think the idea is like to plant the soil of your heart with good seed, uh, to plant the soil of your heart with genuine, excellent things. And then you come to discover that there are fewer nutrients or just less real estate for the weeds to crop up. And I think that's basically what I think about attachment and detachment. So I think we want to be attached to God. I don't think that. I know that. I believe that. That we want to be attached to God and to the things of God. Like, for instance, my experience of religious life isn't so much an experience of becoming a moral juggernaut, becoming more and more independent with each passing day. It's more like it kind of has ruined me. It's ruined me for life, in fact. Like, I've become exceedingly sensitive when occasion should arise where I live in a different building from the Blessed Sacrament. <laughs> Which is like, uh, it's what it is. But I, I was at Seek recently and I was living in a hotel and I was like, I want to die because I just want to die. Now, mind you, the Blessed Sacrament was just across the street and I could make a holy hour each morning just by walking a few paces. Uh, but I've been spoiled, as it were, by the proximity of the Lord, by the intimacy of the Lord in the setting of this life. So the point isn't to live wholly and entirely apart from human society, from friend, from family, from God. Uh, in some kind of strange enlightenment notion, but it's it's to become dependent. It's to become uh, a dependent rational animal in the way that Alistair McIntyre describes it in his book by that name. So we want to be attached to God and to the things of God and to cultivate the habits of mind and heart which help us to be better so. And that will involve us becoming detached from sin and vice. The problem is, with sin and vice, we're talking about privations, okay? So we're not talking about things in the strict sense. Like St. Augustine in the Confessions, he addresses himself to theft, and he's like, what are you? You are so slippery. I cannot pin you down. Uh, well, it's because, I mean, we're talking about a privation. We're talking about something that ought to be there, but isn't there. Um, so often, when we're describing sin and vice, we're describing lower goods, which get in the way of our pursuit of higher goods. So it's that I am so bent on, or I am so enslaved to, whatever it is, food, drink, sexual intercourse, that I can't affirm the higher goods of, you know, my relationship with the Lord, my relationship with my family and friends, etc. And so I invert, or I subvert, the, the hierarchy of goods, and I become a bad person in turn. Okay, so what we're going to do in what follows is just think about certain goods and then think about the ways that we approach them and how, yeah, one way might tend more towards genuine liberty, freedom, the other way might tend more towards slavery attachment. Okay, so I want to talk about addictive things, I want to talk about beautiful things, and I want to talk about personal things. First, addictive things. There are many addictive things in this world, uh, <laughs> and some are like real bad, like heroin, and some I would say are not that bad. Like, for instance, being addicted to licorice. Um, so oftentimes, when you describe behavior as addictive, there'll be somebody waiting in the wings to say, well, you should give it up. Well, you should break the habit. Well, you should address your addiction. Okay, I think that instinct is good, insofar as a lot of things that we describe as addictions are pernicious. <laughs> so drugs being an excellent example of which, or abuse of alcohol, etc. 
Uh, but then there are things that are kind of in the middle or tending more towards the middle of the spectrum towards the licorice end of the spectrum. So I would say you can kind of think like tobacco. I made a video recently about smoking pipes or smoking cigars, or you can think about coffee, or you can think about refined sugar, or you can think about dot, 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 lots of things. Okay, so I don't think that it's always a good instinct to say, I am attached to this thing, therefore I should break the habit. I think what you're looking for is genuine liberty and you're looking to acknowledge why it is that you pursue that course of action and whether that might be addressed in a better way. Okay, so let's talk about this very concretely. Um, so let's think about coffee, let's think about snacking. Those are two things that a lot of people drink slash do. Um, if you, for instance, are in a work situation where your work that you have to shoulder is either dreadful or repetitive or otherwise unsavory, sometimes you'll find yourself looking for ways to kind of cut the day into smaller segments so that way you don't have to confront the endless eternity of terrible moments that await you at your desk. Okay, I get that. Life is sad, life is lonely, life is anxious, etc. We seek ways by which to work our way through. I think that if you go the, ah, I am addicted to snacking or I am addicted to coffee, I should cut them out. Oftentimes you'll find that, that those desires just come back sideways, which I don't think is good. I think it's good to limit your intake of coffee or your limit your snacking, maybe root it out entirely, okay? Um, but, but, but to limit first, to think about it in terms of limiting first, rather than just being like, this is a bad, so therefore I should, it's, it's not bad. It's just a secondary good. It's a secondary good that needs to be referred to the primary good which is the love of God. So what am I experiencing? I'm experiencing sadness, loneliness, and anxiety. I don't especially love the task before me. I'm seeking constructive ways of breaking it up. Okay, good. Well, I think that's a reminder that we need to be recollected because our lives are good to the degree and extent that they are shared with the God whom we love above all things. Please, Lord. Um, and, and this for us is a reminder to be in his presence or to cultivate his presence more consciously, more deliberately, more intentionally etc. Okay? So if you find yourself thinking, I want a cup of coffee or I want a snack, and you're not really hungry, you're not thirsty, you're not really flagging, well, maybe that's an opportunity just to close your eyes and say a prayer. It doesn't have to be long, 10, 15 seconds. Okay? But if you fail to do that, does that mean that your life is a failure? No, no. It just means that you're on the way. And while on the way, you're seeking to cultivate these habits of mind and heart, and there are going to be fits and starts. Okay? So that's just a simple thing. Uh, the second thing is, is beautiful things. I think this is, it just reveals another principle of what we mean by attachment and detachment. I think that our Lord wants us to live beautifully, but I don't think he wants us to live in a way that's kind of maudlin aesthetically wise, okay? He doesn't want us to become addicts of beauty such that we can't do things that are ordinary humdrum quotidian, okay? Um, but, but I don't think that we're destined to live in a cold, dark, and ugly world just because higher things, beautiful things, might be seen as potentially seductive, okay? So we have a fragile nature. You just, you just gotta know that. I live in Europe at present, and I don't know what it's like in the United States, but in Europe, people are talking often about economies concerning energy because of the energy crisis. And so everywhere you go is cold, even inside, and everywhere you go is dark, and it feels like it's damp too. And it's brutal, all right? It's just brutal. <laughs> I don't want to be a big babe because there are other people that are suffering worse. Obviously, those who are directly affected by the war rather than just indirectly affected by it. Um, but, but it's tough because human life, especially during the winter, feels insupportable at times. Okay, so is it bad to get like a little lamp in your room or to even get like a, like a beautiful lamp with a lampshade? I'm currently looking at a lamp which is passed through a piece of wax paper that I got from my kitchen. So that's not especially glamorous. Maybe I'm not the best model when it comes to these things. No, I don't, I don't think that's bad. I think it's good to want to beautify the space. That's one of the things that I love about women's religious houses is they're often, they're, they're more beautiful than men's religious houses, not necessarily architecturally, but in the sense that they're like fresh cut flowers and there's an attention to details and there's a kind of spirit of welcome that informs them, which I love. And I think that our lives should be punctuated by those details. And it's not a weakness. It's not something that just needs to be rooted out so we can all live in sensory deprivation chambers lest we become attached to the things of this world. No, the Lord has invested the things of the world with the promise of his life. So he uses created things so as to communicate to us his grace and salvation. He uses his sacred humanity, which is beautiful. He uses his church, which is beautiful. He uses his sacraments, which are beautiful. 
and the lives of the saints and the preaching of the just and dot dot dot. You can see it in this way. It's, it's beautiful. It's meant to be beautiful so as to commend its truth and goodness, okay? So I think that when we when we look to created things, we should look them as bearing uncreated things, or we should look to them as somehow transparent to God's workings. So we don't want to be lost in them, or we don't want to be sucked into them for all their loveliness, but we want to be directed by them to something transcendent, which awaits them, waits us in and through them, if that makes sense. I hope it does. Okay. The last thing is, is personal things, okay? So sometimes we say to ourselves, all right, I do this in this way, or I do that in that way, and maybe that's just too particular, it's too peculiar, I need to be less singular. I think that's a good instinct. This is something that's certainly hammered into us in religious life, is that you don't want to cultivate singularities. You don't want to stick out like a sore thumb, because the question is, why are you doing that, okay? If it's because of excelling holiness, great, but... Holiness is kind of a secret between you and the Lord, and it's very rare that your holiness is going to be so evident, right, that it's going to mark you out among others, unless, unless it does, right? But, but oftentimes it's like you're wearing this particular pair of shoes because you thought they were sweet when everyone else wears that particular pair of shoes, or you're wearing this color socks when everybody wears that color socks, or you're wearing whatever, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, but, but when we cultivate singularities, it's a way of pointing to ourselves or directing the reference to ourselves because we just want to be buoyed up or propped up in our personal identity. Okay, just what it is, all right? There's going to be some of that in every human life, and the point isn't for it to be all homogenous, bland, and egalitarian. The point is for it to be differentiated because God desires that his glory be communicated in differentiated fashion in creation. Cool, cool, cool. But we're meant to receive that from him, not to kind of cultivate our own idiosyncrasies or eclectic tendencies just for the mere sake of being me, okay? Um, so I think it's, it's good to know who you are and to know what you're for, but we want to be maturing into the identity and the mission that the Lord gives us rather than just picking out random details so that way we can be identified by them. Um, so yeah, you have a particular way, you have a custom, you have a particular rhythm, whatever it is, okay? But I think that the goal is that those become more and more genuine, more and more sincere in the Lord, who is the ultimate arbiter of all things personal. Um, so yeah, if you notice this about yourself, good, uh, great, but don't be overly attached to who you were before such that it closes you off from who you can become, provided only that you consent to and cooperate with what the Lord gives. This is the thing for me when I entered the Dominicans, there was a, there was a Franciscan sister at the university where I attended a, st a student, and she was concerned that when I became a Dominican, I would become a cookie cutter Dominican. I would lose all of my charm and whimsy, which maybe I have. Who knows? Who cares? Um, and so I, I, th I think that many of us have this fear that as we go through life or as we mature, we set her down to our vocations or as we take a nine to five job that we never imagined would be ours, that we, we're going to lose something of ourselves. Don't worry. Okay, the Lord's gonna the Lord's gonna take care of it. I think you can be healthily detached from some of those singularities, idiosyncrasies, eclectic things, uh, so that you can be open to the genuine you whom God has in store, provided only again that you look to Him from whom comes every good and perfect gift. So, those are my musings. Not all attachments are bad. We're seeking to cultivate the good attachments so that lesser, even bad, or evil attachments might go by the wayside, or that our pursuit of lower goods might assume their proper place in the context of our pursuit of higher goods. So look to God in that. To Him be the glory. The rest is not our business. Boom. Okay. So that's what I wanted to share. This is Pines with Aquinas. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the channel, push the bell, get email updates when other sweet things come out, which come out with bewildering frequency. So gear up. Be prepared as... Who said that? Scar? Whatever. It's from The Lion King. Um, yeah, I think it was Scar. God bless me. Uh, the next thing is I contribute to a podcast which is called God's Planning. And I contribute to it with four of the Dominican Friars. And we have lots of conversations like this to determine what it is that we think about things. <laughs> so you're invited into the melee. Those come out on Thursdays with other special episodes coming out on other days that also end in Y. And then third and finally, I wrote a book. And the book is called Prudence, Choose Confidently, Live Boldly. It's almost been out for a year now, which is pretty sweet. So uh, if you haven't yet, pick up a copy and benefit from it. It's basically how to make decisions and abide by those decisions with a modicum of joy, confidence, freedom, and all good things besides. All right, that's what I got for you. My prayers are for you. Please pray for me. I look forward to chatting with you next time on God's Planning. Oh, I just said God's Planning. I meant Pines with Aquinas. <laughs>